Well, the shuttles landed. We told you that just about 12 o'clock. And another, well, not an American, a South African American has landed uh, in the studio. We've been talking about Frank Rodenbach joining us, and he's in the studio. Frank, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Good to have you. And you, an East London boy. That's right. Born and bred. That's right. When? No, we won't go there. We don't go there. Frey Hospital. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. No, I didn't say where. <laughs> Frank, welcome back to East London. And Thank South you. Africa. Are you living in LA now? That's I correct, believe. yeah. What's yeah. it like as it's, a South African in LA? It's, it's, a, it's a very big city. Um, the greater LA probably has about 14 million people. Wow. Uh, thousands of freeways. And it's, yeah, it's just a big city, very competitive. Um, but yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's a, it's, I guess it's a world stage. And, and in the, the gig that I'm doing, acting, mm-hmm. uh, it feels like the World Cup every day. You've got everyone from <laughs> Aussies to... Right through the British to whoever, Russians, all kinds of people, you know, coming to LA to uh, to come and live out their dreams. Yeah. Uh-huh. Find their dream, follow their dream. That's what yeah. you did. That's, That's right. That's what yeah. you did. That's exactly. exactly what you did. Let's yeah. start right at the beginning, though. Go back to when you were, I guess, a little boy. Yeah. When did, when did you first dream about the whole you know acting what I, thing? I think the first time I ever heard myself say something about acting, well, first of all, I was always fascinated with, with going to the movies and stuff. I always enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. And then I remember one day... She could have been like 1982, 1983. I was watching Pop Shop. <laughs> I don't know who can remember Pop Shop. Ian and, Warren. And, and Cole Kikilis, I think yep. was his name. And they had this show on with these kids singing the Green Door song. Uh-huh. Ah, about the Green Door. Yep. Da, da, da. And I was thinking to myself, I want to be that kid. I want to be the kid up there singing. And I remember when I was 11, my, my aunt, we were on holiday, and she asked me, she said, um, what do you want to do one day? And much to my own surprise, I said, yeah, I'd like to be an actor. Wow. And they're like, what? They were like, what? <laughs> you know, you're supposed to go to Rhodes and become an accountant or an engineer or, or you know, do something. Something that, that pays the balls. Exactly, and that we all know. And acting wasn't, you know, considered a gig. And so that kind of was the earliest thing. Mm-hmm. And then I landed up in Hello Dolly in 1988. We, we did this, uh, I was at a gymnastics club i was like a little boarded team from gymnastics and they needed someone who could do tumbling uh-huh. and i and i went along and got the gig and and did it and i remember thinking to myself this is probably the most comfortable environment i've ever been in to be on the stage and and doing all this different thing so i, I didn't consciously know that that that's how it would end up you know uh, uh-huh. acting as a career but i remember thinking that it was a very comfortable environment so that's kind of like the early days of of where i noticed it and, and of course in east london yeah, year in East London. London. Yeah, it was the, at the Guild Theatre in 1988, mm-hmm. and then and then also a good clue is when you the clown in the class. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a good clue that <laughs> acting's maybe a gig. I mean, and I think when I discovered that being a clown in the class could earn me money, that yep. that's kind of like when I went, mm, maybe it's a career. Awesome, man. And what happened from there? How did you did you take lessons or how no, did you grow? no, no? Um, I uh, my first year out of school went to Rhodes, uh-huh. and I graduated with a master's in pool in the cafeteria. And, uh, <laughs> and rugby and, and surfing. That was kind of my degree I studied, um, which found me. And then, then I ended up Mark Andrews. And if anyone remembers Mark, uh, the Springbok rugby player, he was playing rugby in, in France at the time. And uh, I, I said to him, hey, you know, what are the chances of me coming over there? And he said, no, great. There are two clubs interested. And I went over and, and played some rugby in France. And that kind of is where the journey started. And then I got into modeling uh, when, I, when I was in London. Mm-hmm. And um, after three years of being in London, I, st- I studied at a Bible college in London, um, a diploma in theology. And then when I was done with that in 94, came back and then uh, lived in East London for about five months, trying to figure out where, where I should go next and ended up doing modeling in Cape Town. And I think it was about my fourth audition or something, I landed an international commercial for Mentos, those wow. little mints. Yes. And it's crazy, this commercial played in America for about four years and around the world. And my agent was like, what did you do? And I'm like, I don't know what I kind of did, you know, and that's, I must be honest, that's kind of where the bug really bit was when, when I, when I did my first sort of professional job, um, as the lead in this commercial and just, yeah, it was actually quite amazing. And, and it just built over there. I studied a BCom, came back and and eventually studied a BCom degree in economics. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of 99, I landed the gig in CM De Line and, Mm -hmm. um, that was Tion, of course. Yeah. Tion and CM De Line and, Mm -hmm. and spent four years there and had a coach and all that sort of thing and I, so I guess to be honest I, I learned on the job what's you know? it like we're not here to talk about Seven Delon but it is yeah. an immensely popular soap yep. yes absolutely Yeah. what's a typical day like on the set it was hard work we, we would start I'd probably get to work between 7, 7.30 and then you do blocking um, that is basically you have 
probably be about 16 scenes that you have to shoot through the day, mm-hmm. 16 to 20 scenes that you have to shoot through the day. And, the, and what blocking means, they literally tell you where to pick up the cup of coffee, where to walk, where to sit, etc. because you have different cameras uh-huh. and the cameras need to know where you are. Uh-huh. And it's based on, this, on, on the actual script that you, you know, the words that you speak. And do you learn those words daily? Yep, you, every day. Wow. Yeah. And you've got to know them off When do you heart. sleep? Not often. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so th- th- that's what a typical day is. And you block till about 10.30 and then you start shooting until you finish at about 7.30. You, you finish shooting and that happens five days a week, sometimes, wow. at, you know, just six days a week. Yeah. Who was your favorite character to work with? Hmm... <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed working with George Nick Panagiotopoulos we were good friends mm-hmm. and I really actually loved working with Jan Hendrik uh, uh-huh. Volde, Voldemar Schultz yep. the guy was my brother and then of course my, the, the lady who played my mom Vilna Sneeman yeah ah, it was nuts about her yeah. she was always off to I don't know um, where well, she was always off to Varnes Grant. That's right, yes, <laughs> Varnes <Vane's Grant. laughs> yeah, That's right, and I, I loved working with her. In fact, I actually cried my heart out when I, when I shot my last scenes with her because yeah, sure. we, we became like a little bit of a mother and a son situation. Right. Yeah. I'm sure you all become like a family, though. Yes, you cast. do. Yeah. You spend so much time together, you know, mm. so, yeah. And, they, and they, they were great people. They were great to me. So, yeah. Okay. Fond you, memories. You left Seven Alone. Yes. What happened then? Um, well, the reason why I left was because I wanted to pursue movies, you know, and I wanted to grow as an artist and as an actor, and, and you kind of have to keep going, you know. So, I the first thing I did out of Seven Alone was Ludville. There's a car show. Mm-hmm. I presented a car show, and because... I kind of wasn't sure where how to start the whole movie thing, um, but I did connect with Richard van der Berg. He's a you know well-known director through yeah. someone that knew Richard, and I kind of said to him, "Listen, I'm I'm really keen to make movies," and he was like, "Well, I'm busy with a few projects, but let's see what happens." And then um, I'm, my wife and I moved to America, and I think it was 2005 because we kind of realized that they make a lot more movies in America, and if I wanted to make movies, that's where I needed that's where to go. Need to be, yeah. So that's kind of uh, you know where, where it went, and and then. Richard, did, they phoned me out, out of the blue and said, we need a lead actor for um, Faith Like Potatoes. Give me mm. a second. My throat. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And that's Frank Rodenberg's <laughs> cough. Oh, my word. Uh, Are you going to make it? <laughs> water, somebody. <laughs> we'll organize you some water. Cool. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> so anyway, then, then what happened was Richard phoned me up out of the blue and said, you know, they'd, be, they'd been auditioning uh, for CM the Line for quite a while. And I hadn't found someone, but he felt that I, I really fit the part of Angus quite well. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe it was just, I have a bunch of passion. And he said, you know, that's kind of what the, one of the key ingredients in Angus is passion. Mm-hmm. And I uh, came back to South Africa and we shot that movie. And it was crazy because we, we, we set out to make um, as good a movie as possible. And it was, it was at the time it was going to go into DVD and we were going to sell it in South Africa and stuff. But to date, it has sold almost a million DVDs worldwide. Wow. In America alone, it sold 700,000 DVDs plus. It was released internationally as well. That's correct, right? yeah. Yes. yeah. And that's after Sony Pictures USA picked it up. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it's... I, I don't know what to say. It's kind of it's a surprise. Wonderful. You know? And the good news is there's a sequel. That's right, yeah. We, we're currently working on the screenplay to the sequel, yeah. Mm-hmm. So Great. I'm hopefully shooting that before the end of the year, yeah. Very nice. And Hansi, how did that come about? Uh, Hansi actually came out of Faith Like Potatoes, to be honest, because the, the producer of Faith Like Potatoes, Franz Grenier, um, who's Hansi's older brother, uh, wanted to produce the, you know, was going to produce the movie Hansi. And then I went and played golf with him one day. And I'm quite a keen golfer. And, <laughs> and, and one of the things I can do in golf is I can hit far. So it's either very far in the bush or very far down the fairway, but it's going to be far. And he kind of went hey, maybe this guy can do a slog sweep, <laughs> you know, because he, he was happy with the job I'd done it from an acting point of view in, in Faith Like Potatoes, but he needed to know what, you know, how did I play sport and stuff. And I'd, I'd always played tennis and everything, rugby and stuff at school. And then once he saw the golf swing, he said, would you consider playing ANSI? And then from then it became a, almost a year and a half's worth of research and, and looking at it. And, and that's pretty much how ANSI came about. Did you ever meet Hansi? I did actually. That's wow. th- 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 that was kind of serendipitous, I guess is the right word. Mm-hmm. Hansi's mom was friends with my dad when he was at school, and my dad's parents was friends with Hansi's mom's parents. Wow! And so, in 1985, I think it was, France came and played for South African schools in East London. The the the, the Nuffield Week, I think it was called at that mm. time. Um, uh, they came and played in France. Apparently, in the SA Schools team, tried to hook a ball 
top edge. It smashed his nose. And his mom remembered my dad was a, was a doctor, so they brought him to our house. And then while they were fixing his nose, Hansi and I went and played French cricket in the back garden. <laughs> and, I, and I remember my impression of him was, what a fun guy. Just really, just loved hanging out with him. He's the kind of guy that I would have said to my mom, hey, Ma, I want to go and play at his house again. Uh -huh. You know? And that was, at the time, I think he was about 15 years old. Wow. Yeah, and just, you know, I think I was about 11, 12, around about there. And playing him in the movie, how did it affect you personally? Um, I think the best thing that'll sum that up is a little story of... Because I to research a character and to try and find a character, in other words... The, the essence of why you do things. Like, if you're playing Hansi, how does he drink coffee? I mean, stuff as simple as that, or how does he speak to people or whatever. You, you ha that is what finding a character means. So that you're comfortable that when the cameras are rolling, you're just being that person. And I think the day that that happened for me was when I was at Gray College. We were busy doing research and, and stuff like that. And then the headmaster asked me to go and... Um, speak to the boys in the Friday assembly before a huge match against Afrikaans high school Afis. Mm -hmm. And you usually don't just get to speak to the boys because they kind of want to protect the boys and make sure that their heads are right, you know, for this whole thing. And so I was like nervous. I was like, mm, okay, I better come up with something good. And then I went down to the first team rugby field and watched the two teams practice. And this one kid stood out to me and I, I went over to the coach and I said to him, who's this guy? He seems like, a, he seems like an interesting player. He's like this athlete. And he said to me, no, I'm, I'm actually quite worried about this kid because he was in the third team three weeks before. Then the second team guy got injured. He became in the sec he got to the second team. Then the, th then the first team wing got w injured last week and he's now in the first team. And we're not sure, you know, he's a bit of a weak link in the team. And it was strange for me because in my heart, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, this kid's an amazing talent. And I just left it at that. And then that evening I got home and I told my wife, I feel like I need to do something. I need to encourage this kid somehow. And then the next morning I woke up, I had the same feeling. And then when I got to the assembly, I started chatting to them a little bit about how I was at school and, you know, when my life had changed and I'd become a Christian, I, God just changed my perspective on life. And then when I was finished with my chat, I, that's when I felt the moment. And I, and I said, where's, and mind you, I'm just bearing in mind that the, there was about 1,200 people in the assembly hall because parents had been invited and other people had been invited. It's kind of a special assembly on the Friday. Mm -hmm. And I said, where's this, this kid? His name was Donnie. I said, where, where, where are you? And he, and he stood up. I said, you're the, you're the new guy in the first team. And he stood up. The whole school just cheered as one. Wow. And then I said to him, there are three things. That I, that's what I felt at the moment, three things laid in my heart. And I said, there are three things I want to tell you. The first thing I want to say is congratulations for making the team. Whole school just went crazy. And I said, the second thing I want to tell you, I saw you yesterday and you're an amazing athlete. The way you run, it's so incredibly balanced. And I just think that, you know, you've got it. And then I said, the th and then the school chaired again. And I said, the third thing I want to tell you is I need you now to believe that. Mm. And then the school just you know, reserved their biggest chair for the last. Anyways, we left it at that. The next day we went to, uh, went to the match. Match was really tense. First uh, 10 minutes, there was no score. Afi seemed to have had the upper hand. And then one of the centers broke free from the gray team and they grabbed the ball through. It was perfectly set up for this, for this kid, Donnie. He ran through, kicked it again, out sprinted the other guys, scored a try. I felt like the proudest parent <laughs> that's ever lived. And uh, anyways, when all was said and done, he'd scored three tries that match. Wow. And he was the man of the match. And I mean, afterwards, he was crying, I was crying, just hugged it out. And he said to me, you know, what blessed me was that he said to me, I just know that the Lord did something special for me today. Awesome. Yeah. So the upshot of that whole story was I realized that's what Hansi used to do a lot mm -hmm. for players. He would get them to become who they were really, you know, were in terms of their potential. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't a third team player. He was a first team player. Not only that, he was a good first team player. And and that's when I felt like I, I, I captured that special gift Hansi had, mm. you know, apart from all the other stuff. I mean, we're not, I'm not you know, want to go there right now. But that was the one special gift he had, was he was able to draw the best out of other players. And when we interviewed all the other players, from Craig Matthews to Gary Kirsten, all them, that's what they said. That was the one thing he had. That's why he was such a great captain. Hmm. He was able to draw it out of people, you yeah, know. We miss him a lot. Yeah, I know, for sure. The Bang Bang Club. Yes. What's that all about? The Bang Bang Club is essentially a story about the last four or five years of the apartheid era. Uh -huh. And it's a story about four photojournalists that lived in Johannesburg at the time. And 
they had, I don't know whether that one would call it the courage or the madness or a combination of both, <laughs> to go into the townships and to record what was going on in terms of the violence between, in particular, the Encarta Freedom Party and the NT comrades. And just capturing all of that, what was going on. And then also the, if one wants to call it the third force, the sort of government involvement and the fueling of the Encarta and the fueling of that kind of violence, uh, what was going on. And these guys went in there as neutrals, taking photographs of this. Um, a lot of the photographs are incredibly violent, so they weren't printed in South African papers, but they certainly were in overseas papers. And it kind of exposed uh, a really ugly underbelly of South African politics and the and the violence of the time, you know, and the, and the violence in that time of transition. And to sum this movie up, I think is a it's a realistic snapshot of that time. Mm -hmm. And it's super interesting. For me personally, what it meant was it filled in a gap, massive gap of the history that I did not know about. Yeah. And instead of, like I said to somebody earlier and some other journalists, instead of it creating this sense of white guilt in me, it made me feel empathetic. Mm -hmm. It made me feel like I had empathy for someone else's story that I didn't know at the time. And it's not because I didn't want to know the story, I just simply just didn't, know you didn't know it. Mm -hmm. But now that I do know it, what am I gonna do about it? Mm -hmm. How am I gonna invest back into the country to make it a better life for everybody? And I think it's also a good reminder of what it was like and how we never ever wanted to be like that again. I think it's great that we're telling our own stories now yes. as well. Yeah. And I think the good thing about this movie is it's not, a, it's not an opinion piece. It's not so much that we're trying to make a statement. It's more an information piece about what happened. Mm -hmm. And it gives the audience the opportunity to make a, an informed decision about how, how do they want to go forward. And I think for me personally, as an actor who was in the movie, my, my thing was like, it gives me hope that we're not there, not, not in that place anymore. Mm -hmm. But we better watch out because we must learn we, from it. Yeah, we don't want to go there again. Exactly. Yeah, the premiere has happened. Yes, it was in Johannesburg. Okay. But the cool news is the movie is released tomorrow. Wow. Uh, 22nd of July in uh, cinemas all over the country. It'll be in East London. Wonderful. And uh, I might just go to one of those movies tomorrow. Oh, yeah. so get along to wherever it's showing tomorrow. Yeah, Hemingway's, I'm sure it'll show it. Hemingway's and, and uh, Vincent Park, I'm sure it's going to... Okay. Everywhere. And now finally, the real reason that you're in East London. Yes. And I believe you've learned quite a bit about uh, the ladies. Yes, uh, well, ladies before. fashion. <laughs> ladies fashion. <laughs> uh, at our boutique, Ru Ruth Ann Boutique. That's correct. Deborah yeah. Avenue, just above Sculptures. Yes, I came. What were you doing there? I came for the grand opening of the Ruth Ann Boutique. Mm -hmm. um, very good friends of mine, uh, Ashley and Ruth Cox. Uh, they're the owners, and, and Ruth has pioneered uh, this, uh, this whole venture into this... Uh, fashion phenomena that's uh, called Ruth Ann mm -hmm. and um, what, what I really enjoyed about last night is Ruth had all her various ranges and, and, and stuff that she's got in the store uh, she had it on display they had models there and she described all the clothing and I think what I took from it was that it's not just first of all the clothing is phenomenal quality it's uh, sourced from all over the country and all over the world materials and designs and stuff like that and um, what I really took from it was it's an experience uh -huh. you, don't, you don't just go there to go and buy clothing or to uh, just to do impulsive buys. They, they're really there to help you look your best, something that will represent you um, as a woman. I guess uh, I feel like <laughs> I'm sounding like a lady now, but you know what? This is what I took from it. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I, I was astounded at how they, uh, they talk about layering. I mean, I know us, uh, we just, you know, <laughs> seriously, just give us a shirt and a pair of pants and we're good to go, you know? Yep. Whereas this was... Um, it was just amazing, uh, you know, how she described the clothing, how she, you know, presented it and how, I guess, she made the ladies feel that, you know, you, this is a safe place to come and look your best and, and to find something that represents you as a person, your best. Mm -hmm. and, um, and certainly not trying to just, you know, get the sales figures up, but it's more like if you don't feel great and if you don't feel best, then, then don't buy it. But if you do, then, you know, obviously rock and roll and do it. Yeah. Has your wife given you a list? I, I, don't, I don't think she's going to give me a list. She's just going to ignore me in this one. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, th I, think it's, I think it's an amazing concept. It's uh, on Deborah Avenue above mm -hmm. Sculptures. That's and, uh, Ruth Ann Boutique. Yeah, Ruth Ann Boutique. Okay. And yeah, it was, a, it was a wonderful opening. And yeah, I got to tell some, uh, some stories from Hollywood and, you know, different people I've met. And yeah, it mm -hmm. was a really cool evening. Yeah. I was going to ask you that too. We're getting a bit long here. Um, who who have you met quick. that has really stood out? 
that, that um, we would know. Well, uh, w- well, stuff that would relate back to his London um, definitely was meeting Tom Cruise was quite a highlight. Uh, unexpectedly met him um, at a at a, someone's braai at oh. their house. Yeah, it was one of the actresses I worked with in in the Bang Bang Club, Marlon Ackerman. Mm-hmm. We, we just had a party at our house, and Tom and Katie were some of the guests, and. Uh, Ended up having a chat with him, and he wanted to know about where I came from. So I told him the Eastern Cape, East London. He wanted to know about the uh, yeah, Shomari because you don't need malaria tablets, and he wants to avoid that, and he wants <laughs> to come safari, buddy. <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, I ended up uh, talking about it closer with him and Mubaniga Mlaku and all that stuff, uh-huh. and uh, he enjoyed it. He was like, "My gosh, what language is that?" <laughs> you know. So just, yeah, it was good fun. So, very for nice. all intents and purposes, Tom Cruise is a bit of Eastern Cape in him now. <laughs> Frank, in closing, you, you, you know about the glitz and the glamour and the red yep. carpets and the cameras. And, and a lot of the time when we talk about Hollywood and the movie scene mm-hmm. and everything, mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of bad attached to it as well. I mean, you've got mm-hmm. the, the drugs and the drink and all mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Jesus has made a big change and a big impact in your life over the years how do you manage as a christian in that environment because there there must be lots of temptations i mean you you there must be a lot of stuff yeah i think i think if you if you approach it like like jesus approached it because the one thing that we know quite obviously from the bible is that the pharisees had quite an issue because jesus was found around sinners Mm. a lot and he was there with with a with a love and a passion for people's hearts and the brokenness in people's hearts so i think the way that that you deal with it is not to go there to try and partake but to go there to try and minister to people and and the way you do that is not by bible bashing them and whatever mm. the, the, you become friends with people and you get to know them and who they are and what they're about and i'll give you a simple example i know we're a little bit long here is that uh, some of the actors i worked with on a, on a movie um i don't know how even the conversation got to religion and and they said to me um they believe in karma so I said, oh, okay, that's, you know, karma. I said, but gee, I said, karma is a really a hard master because you have to kind of live your own righteousness and then who judges you, you know, whether you did it right or, or not. Yeah. I said, my, my kind of look on life is grace. And they, and they were like, oh, well, what does grace mean? So I said to them, well, the simple little story, I said, my, my dad growing up, you know, before he'd become a Christian, he'd, you know, he lived quite a tough life, smoking and drinking the whole thing. And, and he had... Uh, lived in a lot of stress and stuff and then at the age of 48 had this massive heart attack wow. and uh, basically died 13 times on the operating table and when he woke up from the operation uh, he looked at us at, well he looked at my mom and he was just saying he wants to write he wants to write and then eventually four days later when they took the pipes out of his throat he said to them during the operation it was like there was like a lightning strike and he looked up and there was this sort of nine foot being in front of him and he went Jesus and, and this being said to him no I'm an angel from the Lord and I've come to tell you that you're going to live. And he said he has no, no idea why, but he just said, thank you, and what time is it? And the angel said, it's 5 a.m. And said it just went dark again. And when he, when he woke up, he had the pipes and a lot of pain and stuff. Sure. And I basically said to them is, he didn't, in inverted commas, deserve kind of to live because of the lifestyle he had lived, but yet he did. And God uh. gave it as a free gift, full healing, you know. And I said to him, that's grace. And the funny thing was, was that not a little while after that, they started asking me about marriage and other questions. Mm. So the friendship was gained without condemning what exactly. they believe, but... That didn't, you didn't come across in a judgmental way. Yeah, and I guess that's the best way, you know, to deal with stuff. Mm. And, you know, and then accountability. You've got to have friends. Mm. You've got to have a community of people that you hang out with. You can't you just live in... Yeah, you can't just live in that world, you know, mm-hmm. and friends who love you. And I, and I think... The, 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 one, of the, one of the key things to me is that you need to have very good um, decisions that you've already made in your head so that when you come to those places, it's not even a question about what the decision is. You just mm. know what you, you need. You just know who you are and, and what where you, you need to go. Yeah. Mm. There's certain values and, and things I have in my heart that if I get to that, I'll, yeah. So basically, it's about being salt. If you're going to be salt exactly. in the world, you've got to be where it's needed. Then be salt. And where it's needed. Yeah. And be real. Yeah. Frank, all the best. I could chat for another hour, man. <laughs> no all the best. And uh, you, uh, what, what's the personal dream? You must have personal dreams. Are you heading for... Uh, you, you know what? The personal dream is to to make movies. That's that's the thing I'm passionate about. I love making movies. It's in my blood. I mean, that's right. that's the thing I have so much fun with. But I, but I think my wife and I have had this saying that after having been in, been in Hollywood for, about, I guess, about four years, that if we achieve whatever we achieve and it doesn't mean something to somebody else, mm. then we haven't lived. Mm. And for us, it's really important to 
to bring that back. You know, yeah. Dream role. Dream role. Brave art. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, all the best. Um, we'll chat to you again sometime. We'll keep watching the career. And cool. uh, God bless you richly. Continue to bless you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.